domestic or foreign policy. And as much as the response may be from the Muslim American Society and other groups that, well, there are other groups that do that, I might disagree with other faith groups that do that, but the bottom line is the historical context is very different. When you have groups collectivizing under faith, but yet when they go to Congress or the state legislature, arguing law based in reason, not based in scriptural exegesis, where every reasoned argument they have, they have to find somewhere in the text that proves what they're saying is God's word. That's a very different method of argument. That's back to the time that canon law used to be argued in Europe. And the contextualization of where Islamic, is, Islamic jurisprudence is today is where canon law was in Europe in the 16th and 17th century. So basically, it is us versus us. The clerics are teaching youth that Western society, secular society, is a-religious, is atheistic. Al Jazeera and all these other medias, the uh, uh, Muslim uh, uh, channels and others that are driven by brotherhood type groups or Ikhwani groups as we say in Arabic, are basically teaching Muslims that the only way to a pure and righteous life is through one that's sanitized by clerics and approved by imams like Yusuf Qardawi and other imams that are preachers that have tens of millions of Muslims listening to them that actually have very many immoral things that they teach the kids. At the same time, they teach them some very deep intellectual discussions of scripture. And what happens is that mixture is a volatile reaction. And what happens is when they excuse terrorism one place and they say, well, we don't believe in terror in America, but Israel is okay or Iraq is okay because they're occupied. That type of exception becomes corruption. There's no moral principles that have, cor that have exceptions. It's either right or wrong. Suicide cannot have an exception. It's either right or wrong. But yet many of the, the mentors of Muslims uh, in the West, such as Qardawi, such as Jamal Bedawi, who I believe has a seat on your board, and others, these are Muslims who have exceptions. They say, well, we don't believe in beating of women, but you know, as long as you leave your elbow close to your arm and you, know, you don't swing, it's okay. I mean, this is medieval nonsense. But yet, this is actually the way scriptures are being interpreted. And when Muslims are given the platform to represent Islamic ideas, and they squander it, they squander the bandwidth by talking about victimology, giving stories about suffering of somebody under a king, and somehow that becomes an analogy that we compare to this country, I don't see the, I don't see the analogy. And the problem is that I think Muslims in many ways, especially those in leadership positions in America, are in denial. And if they're not in denial, they are squandering the opportunities they have to begin to bring Islam into modernity. I believe the faith can easily be brought into modernity. And I think that you can take any text that is based on God's word and interpret it in a way that brings it to the 21st century. And you can take passages that talk about war, that talk about battle, and say that these had a context at that time but now our context for conflict globally is based on the government that we give our citizenship to, and no longer do we believe in jihad as a concept. But what happens is you have apologists that try to reinterpret jihad and say, well, it means struggle internally, it doesn't mean holy war, and all this kind of stuff, when in fact, globally, it's been branded as holy war, whether they want to interpret it that way or not. It does mean internal struggle, um, but it has other meanings too. But the bottom line is, is the reason that, that that term is archaic is because the rules for defining jihad are based upon the premise of the Islamic State. And unless they can begin to set aside the Islamic State, there's no way you could live in a society as a minority without being a hypocrite. Now they would tell you that as a minority we follow the laws of the land. Well imagine that there's a minority living in the West that says that as long as we're a minority, we follow the laws of the land, but if we're a majority, we're going to do a bait and switch on you and change the constitution to Sharia and change the law to something else because now we have the majority. So this is where youth get confused and this is where there's an underlying insidious supremacism to Sharia. Now, not all Sharia, there's personal Sharia, 
that guides the way I pray, the way I wash my arms and fasting and my prepare. There's personal Sharia that I don't think is, is a threat to anybody. But public and governmental Sharia that gets involved and that violates our establishment clause is a major threat. And I think you'll find that the majority of Muslims came to this country because they wanted to escape that. And I want to bring you back to my personal story. My family left Syria because the fascist, secular thugs of Syria had destroyed the nation. There was no longer any freedom. Assad had, had wiped out numbers of towns, and many of the intellectuals had just left. And my family had been, my grandfather had been uh, educated in uh, London, as had my father, and they had an affinity for the West. And uh, my dad wanted to get his uh, medical training in the West, in America. And I was raised believing that I could be more Muslim in this country that had complete freedom to uh, uh, wear or dress or, or pray out as we want uh, versus uh, so-called Muslim-majority countries. Now, the Islamists, those that believe in political Islam, will tell you that, well, that's because there are monarchs and secular fascists running most of the governments. Well, in Iran or in the Taliban or in Saudi where you have the Wahhabis running the place, there are Islamists running the place. And it's certainly not freedom and liberty. And I think what has been missing is that modern Islam has not evolved because the, the third path, that, that third option, has not been available to them. In the Middle East or in the Muslim-majority world, it's been a choice between secular fascism of Nasser, Mubarak, Assad, Saddam Hussein, and others, and the Islamism of radical Islamists like Hamas and, and Iran and uh, the Wahhabis. There's not been an understanding of the enlightenment process that the West went through. And I'll tell you that that's the root cause of terrorism, is that there hasn't been a third option. And that, that the underground, the, the uh, irrigation process of the ideas in the Middle East has been missing. There hasn't been a, a laboratory available. And that's why I think that America is the place for the solution for modern Islam. These debates that we have amongst ourselves cannot be had in the Middle East. And when they do have them, it becomes a blip in time. You see a green revolution in Iran. You see the Cedar Revolution where people finally start to get a voice. But then it disappears at the boots of the, of the police. And uh, one day it's the Islamists winning, and the next, the next year it's the secular fascists. But what's happening in America is this debate's been very difficult to have because political correctness has dominated the discussion. And all of a sudden, the word Islam is being stricken from the Pentagon's document on what happened in Fort Hood. And Muslims that come to speak give you long stories about the beauty of Islam and how misguided you are, and you really don't get any sense about where reform needs to happen. And I'll tell you that my narrative is that my family, we built mosques in Wisconsin, in Arkansas, and now one in Arizona, now, they're not $16 million mosques because they were self-funded from this country. They were based on uh, small three, dollars $400,000 mosques. But those humble mosques meant a lot more to us than money that would come from overseas that actually is gotten from the blood of innocent civilians in those countries and then comes over here to try to influence the West. And I'll tell you that this is the battle that's raging, and what's happening is the mixture of our foreign diplomacy coddling the Saudi government, the Egyptian government. I mean, to see President uh, Obama stand next to Mubarak, one of the thugs of the Middle East, and say that Al-Azhar as a beacon of learning and not realize that most of the oppression of women and uh, um, under the name of Islam was being done by imams trained at that university is just folly. Now, I understand he's well-intended, trying to say that we are reaching out with mutual respect, and this is, all, this is all good, but what's happening is you're marginalizing the people that are the solution to the problem. If you don't say the word Islam, and if the government becomes those that determine who are the good Muslims and the bad Muslims, we can't have that debate amongst each other. We can't innovate, and when we innovate, we are told and it's interesting, you'll find in Islamic history so far that science and medical science has had a rich history uh, of innovation. But political science, art, music, philosophy has had a very poor history since 
the 13th and 14th century.